It's 100% entertainment. 100% electricity. 100%. Pipe Bomb Radio with your host, Felix Olmedo. Be the man. You got to beat the man. Austin James. And that's the bottom line. Because Stone Cold said so. And Nate Milton. Can you dig it, dig it, sucker? It is the last, the last show of 2014, folks. We've come a long way in this list this year alone. It just seems like yesterday Mm -hmm. we were preparing to speak to Black Jack Mulligan and Susan Green. Man, I do remember mm-hmm. that interview vividly as well because it was an inter- it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Susan was awesome, and you know, Blackjack's always Blackjack, but uh, Blackjack's the best of all time. In my opinion, <laughs> is Nate there yet? He's here. He's not here. He's not here yet. He will be here shortly. He knows. His, well, he knows the waiting on him. Speaking of last, everybody thought oh. they've seen the last of the authority, but guess what just happened last night, Felix? They're back. I don't really want to talk about it. In fact, I will save my opinion. Action. Yes, they are, and I will save my opinion for after the countdown because I've got I'm a very big okay. point to make, which is re- completely, you know, it just, whatever. I'm going to leave it alone because I'm going to get all built up and angry and frustrated. And I don't want to do that. I want to be happy. Today I is a good day, and Today it is, is a, a new good day. time to celebrate. Kobe Kingston, Biggie Langston, and Xavier Woods. Okay, now that, that's just a slap in the face. That's just a ridiculous gimmick, and you can't deny that. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. <laughs> good thing for guys. But we've but, uh, got, besides you know, anything we, we, they're doing, any, you know, the ascension's going to take him down. You know, people are crapping on that gimmick already. They are they, crapping yeah, on it. On. Well, I'm they can serious. Crap on things all they want. I'm serious. Yeah, they're going to be one of the greatest of all time. Well, we'll watch and see. But I did want to let you know, I mean, obviously those who are listening in tonight, that uh, if you want to call in and talk about any particular item that you enjoyed this year, 2014, definitely give us a call, 347-202-0399. I know Austin and I sat down about a couple of weeks ago to come oh up with God. the top 20 of Difficult 2014. I'm talking about guys like like a Booker T, like a, like a um, Ivan Koloff, like a Black Jack Mulligan, like a Kevin Von Erich, like a, how do you narrow that down? Jimmy Valiant, how do you narrow this down? Scott Hudson. Danny Cage. I mean, my God, we've had a who's who this year. Mm. You know, it was probably you know? one of the most, and I am not joking at all, probably one of the most things, one of the most hard, difficult things I've ever had to do um, while being on Pipe Bomb Radio because, I mean, when you have a great guest week after week, um, uh, it, it's so difficult to narrow it down to just 20. I can't imagine how it's going to be next year. Well, you know, and the funny thing is, last year we chose 15. This year, I know twenty. We had to take, we had to take it up a notch just because it, we we just it, you can't narrow that down to fifteen. Hell, we couldn't even narrow it down to the top three. No, actually, one we thing that we, we can agree on is that Bret <laughs> Hart, who's going to be the first guest of twenty fifteen um, next weekend, is probably going to be the front runner for the top twenty of uh, twenty fifteen in this, next December. And I know he he just joined us. You know, Nate, my man. I know that uh, you missed out on Austin's gloating. You know why he's gloating, right? Obviously, I know you do. If you watched Raw last night, you know why this little fool's gloating right now. Oh, uh, definitely because of the uh, Ryback promo, right? <laughs> no, you know, you you Nate, go. you're in a different world right now. <laughs> if you don't know why I'm gloating, like Phil says, guess what? The authority is back in action. Once you said that they, you've seen the last of them, they're back again. And they're going to be ruling Raw next week. And with a <sighs> huge smile on my face, I can say that Sting... The vigilante, like people are calling him these days, didn't touch the authority at all. He thought he did, but he doesn't have a grasp. (laughs) Well, like I said in the beginning, we'll leave our opinions about this whole horrific scene for the end of the (laughs) the show. And it was horrific, let me tell you. Dark days are coming. But um, with that, I definitely want to bring up the idea that... um, like I was saying, I was, as we were talking before Nate came on, coming down, narrowing it down to the top 20. Nate, man, you have no idea how incredibly difficult this was. I, I can imagine even rather, uh, just the amount of interviews I was on since I started on the show. It's like every one of them was, was seemed to be better than the last one. <laughs> 
you know, I can't deny that. I cannot deny that one bit. You know, uh, from the who's who, from like I was telling him, I could just remember vividly, like we we just kicking off 2014, we had Blackjack Mulligan and Susan Green on the show, and two two wonderful people, wonderful, really great people to and had a lot of great stories to tell, and those two working two together years famous. ago. Yeah, absolutely, NWA and WWE Hall of Famers. But um, rather than talk too much, I'm going to ask you guys what you guys thought. Oh, well, Austin, you already know. Nate, would you care to give any any ideas, any guesses, any thoughts on who you thought came in at number 20? We're going to kick it off right away. That's uh, uh, a – like you said, we got so many great interviews and had so many great (laughs) guests. Uh, Give me a hint. Is is this person a former wrestler or is this person – uh, someone associated with the wrestling business that actually was not a competitor. Not a competitor, a part of the wrestling business. Okay, then I'm going to guess that uh, it was probably Austin's favorite moment of the year, and I'm going to say it's uh, the trainer from the Monster Factory who, who schooled Austin in, in the ways of pro wrestling. <laughs> Austin never forgot that moment either. But I will say you are incorrect, and that's okay. That's okay. Oh. Number twenty on the countdown actually takes us back to earlier this year. I was right. It was around WrestleMania season, if I'm not mistaken. Help me out, Austin. Uh, we brought in former WCW announcer, the one and the only Scott Hudson. And oh. here you listen to. We're going to play a little clip of him talking about how he got into the WCW, how he was noticed. Hang tight for a moment, guys. You know, while you were getting your working your way through the independence and. Uh, what got you noticed by uh, I'm not unless it was maybe Eric Bischoff unless uh, or somebody else that was working for WCW. Um, how how did you get noticed by them? Well, you know that's a great question. The uh, and the answer is working in Atlanta, Georgia. And again, this goes back wow 25 years. You know when you when you were in wrestling, there was really no better way to get noticed than just to be in the business in Georgia uh, because. Even through the 70s and through the 80s, with uh, Atlanta being the headquarters of Georgia Championship Wrestling and for a while one half of the headquarters of Jim Crockett Promotions, there was still a healthy independent wrestling environment in uh, North Georgia. Uh, And again, I went through the story with Joe about, you know, offering to work for free. And I'll give you guys, you know, the free advice that if you want to make it in the business, volunteer to work for free. And and the business will beat a path to your door, and when and that's what I did. And when when when, when I was working for the Georgia Group with with uh, with WCW being headquartered right here in Atlanta, a lot and I mean a lot of the guys would watch our North Georgia show in Atlanta. We had a uh, or Joe Petticino had an eight hour block from um, uh, six at night until. Two o'clock in the morning on every Saturday night on Channel 69 in Atlanta, he would show, oh my God, six hours of independent wrestling. Not not necessarily independent, but he would show like an hour of WCW, an hour of the WWF at the time, and then the Puerto Rico show, the Memphis show, the North Georgia show, the Portland show. Wow. So in Atlanta, every Saturday night, if you were really into wrestling, you got every territory there was on one channel I would love to have been growing up on every Saturday. And and the WCW guys would uh, would watch that block as they're sitting home and they're working a you know a house show somewhere, and and they watched the show. And Steve Frazak, again my my second best friend in the world behind my wife, we would you know we would we would do everything we could since we were working for like five bucks a month. You know, that's, that's literally what we got paid. Um, so we figured, like, what are they going to do, fire us for five bucks a month? They're going to find somebody better than us? So we would do each, do everything we could to crack each other up. And fortunately, our sense of humor was the same sense of humor that that Eric and and Paige, Simon Dallas Page, and um, the late, great Chris Canyon, and Disco Inferno, and yeah, um, Brian Clark, who was... Uh, was Wrath for a while and uh, Adam Bomb, those guys that lived here, they loved yeah. it because they loved our sense of humor. So when um, <laughs> when when they would watch the show, they kept it in the back of their head. You know, these guys are funny as hell. They're putting on crap wrestling on Saturday night, 
and making it interesting. So that, that's how we parlayed that into uh, both of us making it to uh, WCW and ECW, respectively. Now, he was a lot of fun to talk to. I swear, Scott, he took us... He took us to, you know, to back to those t- those days of the Monday Night Wars and working with Bischoff and and, and Bobby Heenan and even he even mentioned the time when uh, if you uh, you might remember this Nate I'm not sure how how vivid you watched how avidly you watched uh, WCW but do you remember that episode when he apparently had to wear nothing but a tie he had to, like yeah. a, wear a sh- no shirt on or something like that <laughs> they made him wear no shirt and just his tie or something like that he talked about that laughingly of course but he was a lot of fun. Scott was great. Any any memories of uh, any any memories of Scott that you want to share, Austin? You know, there's uh, there's a lot from from WCW, especially. I mean, this guy's been a part of the WCW, but I mean, br- very very briefly in WWE. And, you know, he also was actually a backstage guy for uh, for TNA and also a commentator right at the beginning. Um, but you know, yeah. I, I have to say, I mean, besides WCW, I want to just mention in TNA right at the beginning. I mean, talking about the, the asylum years, he was there for. I mean, all the X Vision action that happened, and I know Nate, and especially you know Felix, you're gonna understand what I'm saying. The X Division built TNA, in my opinion. I mean, I think that's uh, the, the the standard bearer for everything that came afterwards. Um, and Scott uh, had the opportunity to call all that action right at the beginning. Okay. Yeah, he did, actually. I didn't watch the very first year or two, but I did catch it in, 20, in 2004 uh, when they were still on Fox Sports Net. But, and that's probably right around after the time he left. Sadly, I didn't get to see him after that. I do remember him uh, calling a match in the WWE right after the takeover. But, um, yes, I, that, I, we've, we had to include him in there. He was a lot of fun. We'll keep the ball rolling here and coming in at number 19. We go back to February of this year, and a young man who, well, he had he started out really young, and made a name for himself quite quite quickly, and we actually got to got the chance to hear a little bit about him and his career, and the clip I'm going to play comes from that from that show when he spoke about working with Rick, with uh, the Nature Boy Ric Flair. Who am I speaking about? The one and only Kenny Dykstra. If you knew him as Kenny from the Spirit Squad, Ken Doan, Kenny Dykstra, however you knew him. Here he is as he's talking about working with the Nature Boy, Ric Flair. When you actually were able to uh, move on into a singles career, you actually got to work with, uh, uh, well, like Rick, with Ric Flair. It looked like that that feud was actually was going to be something pretty huge. And I mean, what was it like working with Nature Boy? It was awesome. It was great. You know, it was it was a little intimidating at first because, like, well, when I trained originally, I was trained by Killer Kowalski, so he would always have the mentality of. Don't talk about your match before the match. Talk about your match during the match. Just go out and do it, you know? Mm-hmm. But, you know, growing up as a kid and stuff, I started training at 13. So I trained from 13 to 18 with Kowalski. And, you know, you don't want to mess up. So you, you kind of call yeah. stuff beforehand, and everybody does it. And then you get on the Indies, and then you work with other guys who train from different people, so they do it. And, and then once you're on WWE, you're on TV, so you have to have stuff planned. It's like, a dance, you have to walk through everything. But working with Flair, yeah. I, I would never see him. I would be there, I'd get to the arena at one, like we were supposed to. Excuse me. And then uh, I, I wouldn't see him. I wouldn't see him in catering. I would never know where he was. So I had no idea what I was doing. And then the agent would be like, he usually be steamboat. And he'd be, he'd come over and say, okay, you guys, you got 10, 12 minutes tonight, Rick Flair over, or you over. And I was like, okay. Yeah. He's, like, he's like, where's Rick? I don't know. Well, I don't know where he is either. Okay. I don't know what to do then. <laughs> so then I would never see Rick, so then I'd be all set up, and I'm standing in a gorilla position, and then they would play my music, and then right as they played my music, Rick would start coming up in a gorilla position in his robe, and he'd be like, hey, take your forward for the finish. And I'm like, okay, cool. Or he'd be like, when I have to take your forward, just roll it out and wait to finish. And I'm like, okay. And that's the only time I see him during the day, that and then during the match. So that didn't that didn't like if it was me I would probably get really nerve wracked. Well, I, of course you're a professional, but I'm saying that you didn't get like nervous when he did that to you. Uh, the first time I did, and the first time Mike Kyoto was the referee and he was like, "What's the finish?" and I was like, "I think he said figure four. and he's like, "What do you think he said?" He's like, "We're on Raw," and I was like, "I don't know what the finish is." I was like, "I, don't, I didn't see him all day." I said, I don't Chris Blair, you sometimes you don't yeah. know what he says. 
I was like, he's gonna change it anyways when we get out of here. So then, like, when Rick came out, I was like, that was the only time I ever like forgot that I was in a match because I like kind of started clapping for him. And Kyoto hit me and he's like, "Hey, you're wrestling." And I was like, "Oh yeah, my bad." <laughs> I said, I, "I was cheering for him." So then Rick was like, was beating me up and he gave me a fat lift in the first match. And like, you know, I was always afraid to hurt him. Like he's an older guy. Yes, he's tough, but like he's an older guy. You look at him and you go, he's an older he's guy. Older, yeah. I don't hurt him. You know, I don't want to lose my job. So he gave me a fat lift, and then the next night, I wrestled him again, and I was like, forget this crap. I'm going to beat the crap out of this guy. He gave me a fat lift. So after that, it was on. I didn't even clap for him. I don't care what he's ever to finish. We're fighting. But he, he, brought out the best, he brings out the best in people because he makes you he does. think on the fly. He, he, doesn't make, he doesn't let you memorize what you're supposed to do. He's like the old school where he makes you yeah. work, and he makes you better at your craft. The one and the only, working with the Nature Boy, Ric Flair. I can be very nerve-wracking at, at times, I'm sure, but what a career this young man has had at such a young age, getting involved. We, I'm hoping, we Hopefully we can bring him back sometime in 2015 because he had such an instant, extensive, well, let's just say we didn't touch on a lot of things that we could have touched on, and hopefully we'll get him back. But uh, he was definitely a lot of fun to talk to. Yeah, you know, Kenny definitely reminds me of, you know, a lot of myself. Um, considering especially <laughs> how my voice sounded then, right? Um, uh, much how it sounds <laughs> now. Um, uh, both that young one, boys, you say, started pal. at a young age, and he was like 15 years old when uh, he started, West, you know, training with Killer Kowalski, a WWE Hall of Famer. And now he is, you know, in the WWE, signed to a contract um, at the age of 16 or 17. That's insane. Nobody's ever did that. Well, maybe, maybe the Hardys. I think the Hardys did it when they were like True. 17 or 18. I think they were like, uh, but they were that like was the only people the, I remember. They were the guys that were putting over the main the main stars at the time. But um, he was a lot of fun. He was a lot of fun, and we'll we'll keep the ball rolling as we start rolling into this countdown. We're going to hear some of the greats for sure. But uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to number 19. I'm sorry, number 18. Losing count. With this, it goes back to this past September. Uh, he was he was big in the in the Portland, Oregon area, and pretty much big all over. But I mean, he really got his name. I felt he really established himself there. We brought on the one and only the grappler, Lynn Denton, to the show. And one of the first things I know, I think I probably beat Austin to asking him this, and if he got mad, I apologize, pal. But um, I had to ask him, who was it that really invented the DDT? Jake Roberts always said that he was, you know, credited with being the one that did it. But Lynn always said that he was the one that invented it. Why don't we hear what he has to say? Who who actually was the one that invented the DDT? Um, actually, if you want the truth, I always said it was me. Jake said it was him. <laughs> and uh, we, had a, we even had a contest here in Portland that I ended up winning. But the truth of the matter is, it happened. We did it together. It was like a... It's a total mistake in the ring. He, we, back then, we were going like 45 minutes every night, and it was in Lake Charles, Lake Charles Louisiana. It was real hot in the summer. It was like, um, I don't know, 100 degrees. It felt like in that ring. And uh, we're wrestling and um, sweating real bad, and, and we're working a front face lock, and I was calling spots out of it and going back to the front face lock. And he, he would crank it and work me back down to the mat, and I'd fight my way back up. Or, and I was, he, had, he had the front face lock on me, and I called a – Another spot where I set out and took off, hit the ropes, a couple of tackles. He did something to me and then hit me with a knee lift and then he went for that, that hold. And when he went to grab the front face lock, we both slipped and we went down. Both of us went down together, basically like a DET, and the, the crowd just went, it popped. And I told Jake, I said, did you hear that? I said, let's try that again. Well, the next time we did it, Jake slapped me on the back real hard. It made an even louder noise, and the crowd really popped. And so we did that for about... We were on the loop for about a week around doing matches, and so we used that as like a high spot during the match. And then finally, when we got back to TV to do TV in Shreveport, me and Jake talked. I said, "Bro," he said, "I'm gonna make that into a finish." And that's before he even had a name. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so he named it the DDT, and he started using it for a finish hold because it was so devastating looking. No one, no one was doing it, and so um, it uh, it worked out to be the DDT. And of course, he claims that he invented it. I claim I do. It's great for TV, but we actually did it together. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And there you have it. It wasn't one or the other. It was both of them. 
And I know, I believe, Nate, you were there for that interview as well. Do you, what are your memories on uh, speaking to the grappler? Yeah, that was a very fun interview, and, and I like the interviews that kind of catch me by surprise. You know, like when I, I knew when we talked to Kamala or when we talked to Kevin Von Eric recently that those were going to be great experiences. But, uh, you know, with uh, Mr. Denton, I was like, okay, I've, I've seen this man's work, but – I didn't know it was going to be as engaging, as fun as it was, and he was very honest, very open, and that was really one of my highlights of, of the year, t- speaking with him. Definitely. Austin, any any uh, great memories you, or recollection you want to speak about uh, with the, uh, as we spoke to the grappler? Excuse me. Well, definitely the, inter- the intriguing part of the interview. I mean, the, the question I think would had to be asked was the, the question of the DDT, who really came up with it. You know, Jake says he did and Lynn says he did, but the truth is, they did it together, you know. Um, I guess you can't have, uh, I guess, accidents. On the, the accident came on the part of uh, of um, Lynn, maybe if he, when he slept, but then Jake just turned it in with his, his wrestling mind, just turned it into something that looked interesting, but a really devastating move. And I think, honest to God, I think it gets used. It, it's not, like, they don't consider it as much a devastating move as it is, as it was today. You see, you see guys do it all the time, and they just get back up, like, you know, five seconds later. So I don't understand the whole entire reason behind that. Maybe um, uh, just with the future, you know, everything's going fast. It's like the sound of my voice, right? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know why it's not considered as devastating as it was back then. Yeah, the DDT tends to, it, it, well, you know, you believed it really did something when Jake did it. As Yeah, like you said, as time went on. It almost became almost a joke now. It's almost not saying it's saying that it, they can get right up afterwards. When, whereas when Jake did it, you believed they were knocked the hell out. I mean, think about the fact when he dropped a dragon on his head on the cement. Now you do that nowadays. You think they're going to get up? I don't think so. But I mean, that's a bad example. But you know what I mean. You know, it looked more realistic. It felt more real when Jake did it than it does today. But. um as we move on, we are going to go up to, uh, we, as we approach the 30-minute mark on the show, we're going to keep it up to the countdown here. So I'm going to go up to number 17. Number 17 actually was fairly recent. A very good, a very uh, bright young man with a take-no-nonsense, take no or maybe no-nonsense, take-no-prisoners, maybe that's a better term, type of attitude. The one and the only, Mr. Luke Hawks coming in at number 17. And we spoke to him this past November, and I brought up a topic of his that he had mentioned he talks about quite a bit. And it talks about how he met the one and only, the hardcore crazy legend that he is, Terry Funk. You know, actually, I heard somewhere at some point, if you'd like to have have you elaborate for me, that you met Terry Funk like in the in the beginning part of your career. Uh, how did you come to meet him and was it you know, and tell us how what that relationship Terry started. Funk was the first wrestler I met when I was a kid. So um and then I met Terry Funk again when I was 16. Uh I skipped school to go uh WCW was in Biloxi and I knew some of the guys back then cuz I kind of kept in touch with some of them. I was I was working my way in the business. So I knew what hotel the guys were at and everything else. So I went and talked to Terry then and I've always talked to Terry. And then I talked, you know, in XGW, Terry's, you know, one of those guys I look up to a lot. I wish I got to spend more time with him and been able to, you know, actually spend time on the road with him and maybe even wrestle him before he hung it up. But, um, you know, I'll never get that experience now. But um, as far as back then-wise, like the first time I met Terry, I, I bothered the hell out of him. I was about 10 years old, and there was at some old shows called, I think, NWF in New Orleans. And my real dad took me, my real dad, I never really had a relationship with him. Never spent much time with him. That's a whole other ball game. But my uncle mm-hmm. wants him to take us to a wrestling show. He didn't want him, so he gave him to my dad. So my dad knew I liked wrestling, so my dad took me. And I didn't know who Terry Funk was at the time because, you know, I didn't catch all the local TV. Like, I grew up dirt poor. I didn't have a TV half the time. But when I got the chance to watch WWF or, you know, any of that, you know, back then, I, I, if wrestling, any kind of wrestling was on, I was watching it. So, uh, or if it was on the radio, because y'all probably don't remember. I don't know how old y'all. I know Austin Junk. WWF used to come on the radio, so I used to listen to the radio program. Like when yep. Jake the Snake Snake got, when, 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 when Damien got squashed by Earthquake, I listened to all yep. that on the radio. <laughs> so, 
So, Wasn't uh, that with uh, Jim Ross and, Gor- and uh, Gorilla Monsoon doing the radio then? I don't remember because I was so young. It was so long ago. Okay. But, uh, but I mean, I used to, that's how I, I, a lot of times I listened to the show on the radio. So, because like I said, I didn't have a TV. I was four. But anyway, so I went to these shows and, uh, you know, I was in Tuxedo Terry was doing, he was doing commentary. He was doing the host and, you know, he was our Brett Landry. So, um, my dad brought me over to him. My dad's like, hey, this is Terry Funk, you know? And I was like, holy hell, my dad knows wrestlers. He didn't. <laughs> you know, just but as a kid, that's what I thought. So, <laughs> yeah. and Terry was such a nice guy. He just talked to me and kept talking. So I just bothered the hell out of him the whole night. And I pretty much didn't leave aside except when they were filming and, like, kind of shooting me off. And, maybe, and Terry never once did. And Terry would always spend time and talk to me. And it was just... You know, so after that, like, Terry Funk was my hero all of a sudden because it was like this wrestler is giving me the time of the day. So it was just, man, one of them experiences that, you know, for the rest of my life I'll remember and I'll tell stories about it and it'll always be, always be a special moment for me. And now as a, as a professional himself, he actually inspires young younger generations as well. Luke's always a, is a pleasure to speak with. He is... He's a, he's a well. He's definitely they're in, involved in a in a territory war between WWE Hall of Famer Booker T and the reality of wrestling and his crew of the Wildcats with Luke Hawks. That has gotten pretty intense. Uh, Austin, who was there when there, when, when uh, Booker turned and attacked a lot of the Wildcat guys, and that was pretty crazy. Would you say, Austin? That is probably the biggest understatement of the year. Right there. <laughs> Give that a slammy award. And i got to tell you, nobody expected Booker to do what he did. And, and uh, I'm still shocked because, you know, he was he was being all nice to everybody. And then to turn on, you know, Wildcat guy, you know, Luke Hawks, uh, like he did, was, was was shocking, to say the least. I mean, I didn't expect it. And nobody expected it. And, and for him to do that, I mean, it just shows that um, uh, independent wrestling is going to be on fire. Oh, definitely with Wildcat versus ROW. There you go. We're going to keep this countdown going. We're almost to the number 15 spot. But when coming in at number 16 was something that was mentioned earlier. Was a man that... <laughs> he impressed me so much because he did something that no guest has been able to do yet. <laughs> he shut Austin up pretty much the rest of the show. And I'm not yeah. saying that to be mean. It's not coming off like that, but... I am talking about the one and only Danny Cage of the Monster Factory at number 16. He is going to give us a brief, uh, in, you know, uh, tell us how he got his start, and a little bit of the history of the Monster Factory. So we'll take you back to that interview right now. How you actually became, got familiar, how you got in contact with the Monster Factory, how did, it, how did you hear about it, how did you end up getting involved with it? Well, the Monster Factory uh, popped up in New Jersey and the... Early 80s, it was 83, uh, Buddy Rogers and Larry Sharp started it uh, just to train Buddy Rogers' son. Larry Sharp uh, let me know that Buddy, you know, grabbed a hold of Larry and said, I like the way you train. You trained Kevin Von Eric and Tony Atlas and a couple other people, and I'd like you to work with my son. So Larry took that as a big compliment. He basically equated it to having Babe Ruth uh, ask you, uh, ask you to teach his son how to hit, because Larry was a huge Buddy Rogers fan, and you know he, he just said, "There's not many people I mark out for. I really don't." He said, "But Buddy Rogers is one of them, and uh, he's larger than life." And turned out Buddy Rogers' kid didn't even want to wrestle, so Buddy Rogers left the school to Larry. Larry named it the Monster Factory. Um, started popping up in all the newspapers around New Jersey. I guess I was like. Uh, around 12 years old or 13 years old in 85 or 86 when uh, I was in the newspaper. And I remember it was a picture of Raven, who then was Scotty the Body. And I think there was a couple pictures of some other guys in the paper and just talking about the monster effect. And, and of course, Bam Bam Bigelow. And um, it just uh, was always in my mind. I was always a wrestling fan and, from day one, when I started watching it, I always wanted to be a wrestler. Um, would even study match tapes, uh, read books on it, magazines, everything I get a hold of. You know, 
back in the 80s, there was no internet, so everything was tape trading and, and going to the newsstand and buying new magazines and back issues and just learning the history of wrestling. And uh, finally in 94, uh, graduated high school in 92, uh, did some odd jobs, and my dad was like, you know, I want you to go to college. I was like, no, nah, I really don't want to. I want to I want to be a pro wrestler. And he's like, uh, well, that's, you know, that's, that's not a career. You, you can't do anything. There's, there's no future in that, so I'll pay for you to go to college. I said, well, why don't you just pay for me to go to wrestling school? It's a lot cheaper than college is. Because it's not, it was thirty five hundred dollars, and college was like sixteen twenty grand a a, a year. So um, he said, "All right, I'll make you a deal. You come move to Florida, you get in shape, you show me that you want to do it." And I was already in good shape. I wrestled amateur in high school. Uh, that was the first thing I did as soon as I realized I wanted to be a wrestler. I, I went and started wrestling amateur, which ironically. You know, I come to find out that that's what Larry's uh, advice he got from Red Barry when he was like eight years old. He said, if you want to be a pro wrestler, get amateur experience. So it's kind of weird how me and Larry paralleled with getting the amateur experience because you don't believe how many people walk in the doors of the Monster Factory and they say, I always wanted to be a wrestler my whole life. I said, did you wrestle amateur? And they say, no, I don't understand that. Um, But anyway, uh, so I went and I moved to Florida. And I uh, got in great shape. I left my girlfriend of a couple of years, and there was no internet then, no cell phones, no nothing. So I just picked up, left, and said, you know, write me. I'll be home in a couple months. Stayed there for like six months. Came home, went to the monster factory. The headbangers put me through my tryout in '94. It was uh, Chaz and Glenn were there, uh, Frank Finnegan, a couple other guys, and um, went through the tryout and. And, like, I always say, like, you know, not to put myself over or anything, but, like, I just remember doing it and it feeling so easy, so natural, to the point where when I was running the ropes, they were dropping down in front of me, and I was already the second or third time hitting the ropes. I was able to be coordinated enough and to function and to not panic and know what to do when I was doing the drop down. So Larry called me in the office and said, um, when do you want to start? And I said, I'll start your next training session. My dad's paying for it. And, and there you have it, folks. Give a little brief intro of the Monster Factory and uh, <coughs> give a little bit of his start in the wrestling business at that time. <coughs> he was you know, I really want to, I definitely want to say that, I mean, I, I, I really hope you guys don't think that I, that I don't have any respect for Danny Cage because I, I do I have the world of respect to have universes so of respect for him. Um uh, you know, but yet he definitely uh, put me in my place, you know. <laughs> um but I mean as well as he should, you know, and um uh, Danny Cage I I respect the hell out of truthfully. And um I will Trust me, Austin, that was not even that respect was the furthest future. thing from our minds thinking that you didn't mm-hmm. respect the man. We were just laughing yeah, yeah. because you like to run your mouth quite a bit and somebody finally should shut you up. And <laughs> And you didn't come back and said you didn't say anything, well, as much, throughout the rest of the interview. That was the part we laughed at. No. Not saying that you didn't respect him at all. It had nothing to do with that. No, no, no. It's cool, and I want to ha- definitely have him back for sometime in 2015. Because I mean, Mox Factory is definitely my future. I mean, it's, it's one of the best training schools in 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 the world today. I mean, there's a lot of them, a lot of uh, training schools, but this one has the uh, the experience and just uh, the years of of a uh, great training, Larry Sharp, you know, kicking it off and uh, just making it um uh, what it is today with Danny Cage taking the reins. Yeah, that was one of my no. favorite in- interviews of, of the ahead. year, Felix, and and you uh-huh. know, not just not just because of uh, you know he put our young Padawan in his place, and of course you know we we tease off about that, but we love him. But if yeah. you're interested even remotely in becoming a professional wrestler. I think you need to go back and listen to that interview because, like Danny said, he basically took that Harvard education that you can kind of get at the Monster Factory, and he broke it down and gave you a little bitty piece of that. And I think, like like Rick Flair used to say, now it's time to go to school. If you're actually serious at all about being a pro wrestler, that interview with Danny Cage I think is a great place to start. There you go. And we're getting there. We're getting there, folks. We are getting there. 
we're going to keep it going here, and then we're going to we're going to talk about these these five choices that we've given so far. But let me give you the fifth choice that was given. It was this past summer, uh, after a few temps, we brought on the trainer of champions. Well, let's just say he's one of the trainers of champions because he's he's one of the great trainers in the history of wrestling. Uh, I am talking about the one and the only, Mr. Big Bill Anderson. He was on the show last summer, and we came up on a topic that is near and dear to my heart because I, I have so much admiration and respect for this man as he spoke about the one and the only Mr. Bobby the Brain Heenan. One of my all-time favorite managers I have to bring up because uh, a few months ago, I'm going to say late last year, I had posted on one of my uh, uh, fan-run pages on Facebook for Bobby the Brain Heenan, and I had posted mm-hmm. one of your pictures on there and uh, that you've taken with him. And, you know... People just love to hate that, love to hate Bobby, but he he he's done so well with his his career. And you know, I try to express on that page, you know, just because his health looks like it's not great, doesn't necessarily mean he's gone. People take it like he's he's he's, he's going to be leaving tomorrow or something. I said, you know what? Yeah. The stories I've heard from the brain, from you know, he has still got the eye of the brain. He's still got the mind. You know what? His right. his don't let the looks deceive you. He's still all Bobby. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, and let me tell you this, and to the public itself, I have nothing but respect for Bobby the Brain Heenan. Uh, Bobby is a bigger man than I'll ever be. Let me tell you, for him to go out and face the public, and he does book signing or book signings and autograph sessions constantly, he is one hell of a man. Uh, to not let his appearance affect him, uh, he's a stronger, bigger man than many of us will ever be, ever. And I have nothing but respect for him. And uh, he is, uh, I've, uh, you know, I'll tell you a funny story. I was at a Cauliflower Alley Club reunion. This is probably 10 years ago in Vegas. And mm-hmm. I kind of just wandered in on the conversation with the, three or four people were standing there and Bobby Heenan's name had come up. And I didn't even know any of the people in this conversation. There was like three women and a guy standing there. And I just walked in and I just started saying, God, you know, let me tell you, Bobby Heenan is my hero. And I said, I... Bobby was one of several inspirations for me to ever break into wrestling. Back in the old days with the covers of magazines like The Wrestler and Inside Wrestling, mm-hmm. Bobby Heenan was always all bloody with the blackjack Lanza and and, and uh, Mulligan or with the Valiants, and I loved it. It was just so... Mm-hmm. It was just so colorful to me, the whole world of wrestling back when I was a teenager. And I thought, this is so cool. I hope to meet this guy someday. And I ended up becoming very good friends with Bobby, but back then I just dreamed of the guy. So I'm telling these people in this conversation, I said, Bobby is my hero. He is one of the greatest men I've ever come to know, and I just absolutely adore and love the guy. And one of the women says, oh, thank God you said all this, because that's my husband. And I said, oh, my God, (laughs) I didn't know. I'm sorry. I I didn't realize that, you know, you were his wife. And she said, well, it's okay. You complimented him. And I said, well, everybody compliments Bobby. And... Uh, you know, uh, he was definitely, you know, and that's just a great story. And, you know, B- Big Bill, he, I respect the man greatly because he was a, he was actually the guy that trained the Ultimate Warrior. And I believe he also well, trained hey, Sting. And not, and not just, just not, you know, go ahead. Not just the Ultimate Warrior, he also trained the other half of the Blade Runners, the Icon Sting. Well, I was getting to not that, but you had to cut me off. <laughs> yeah, well, I have to cut you off, but he's got to mention Sting. We're going to talk about more later when we mention the authority. Of course. Oh Lord. Anyways, I got to pose a question to you guys, Austin. I'll come to you. I'll go to you last because you 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 helped me sit down with this countdown. But Nate, what do you think of the countdown so, so far? You know, from twenty to fifteen. How do you think we? You know, pretty good choices. Would you rather have seen somebody else than that? I mean, feel free. Be honest as you as you can be, please. Definitely some good choices so far. I, I, I'll uh, let you know if I feel like anybody's been left off when we get to the next five because I have a better idea of who who might not be on the countdown. But I would say definitely some of my favorite interviews that I was a part of, of course, Danny Kays, like we mentioned. Uh, Luke Hawks was, was kind of refreshing to talk to him, uh, a guy that I think has got his head screwed on straight, and I look for oh, good sure. things in his future. And then, of course, uh, the grappler, Lynn Denton. I think that was, you know, one of my surprise conversations of the year, again, just because it's like, you know, I, I knew we were going to have a good chat, but 
for him to be as open and as honest and as funny as he was, that was surprising to me. You know, yeah, Lynn, <clears throat> Lynn was, um, I don't think I ever, I had at that point in time, it, well, at that point in September, I don't remember, recall laughing as much as I did in, until we got that interview. Mr. Denton, he was hilarious. He told some great stories. You know, his his great uh, friendship with uh, Roddy Piper and, and just, you know, overall, his book is incredible. You know, a great, great guy to talk to. I'd love to have him back again. Um, but, yes, I've enjoyed the choices. Austin, any thoughts on the choices? Do you feel like maybe we chose the right ones for the five that we've chosen so far? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this. I'm going to give my opinion when it's all said and done. Okay. No, that's fair enough. Fair enough. We'll keep the countdown rolling, folks. Keep the countdown rolling. Number 14 on the countdown was something I had been working on for quite a number of months. Finally, it came down, and it was going to happen, and we made it happen. We got to speak to the one and the only Mr. Jimmy Corderas. He was a longtime WWE referee, and he had, you know, I, I, I got his book. Interesting, interesting, interesting read, no doubt. Um particular topic that came up was how he got his start. He got his start working with the one and the only Jack Tunney. And let's hear the story. How did you get in co- how did you get to meet uh, Jack and and, and uh, I believe it was Frank Tunney too, correct? Uh well, no, at the time Frank had passed away, so Jack was running the uh, uh Jack Tunney was running the Canadian office. And uh gotcha. before before um the WWF at the time moved in, uh, he booked his talent mainly through Crockett, Jim Crockett Promotions. But he, what was cool about, you know, Maple Leaf Gardens before before the WWF takeover was that they used talent from, let's say, you know, Jim Crockett Promotions. But it, they also brought in people from the old uh, WWF before that, you know, guys were exclusive to them. Uh, AWA guys would show up. Uh, you'd get guys from Memphis, which would be kind of cool. It was kind of a, a mixed bag, which is you know, very unusual and, and very cool at the time. But as for how I got to work for him, to make a long story short, um, I was like what you would call a regular every every couple of weeks at uh, Maple Leaf Gardens. They used to do uh, Maple Leaf. Well, they used to run Maple Leaf Gardens every three weeks and do TV in Brantford uh, Wrestling Challenge mm-hmm. on Monday uh, afterwards. And I would be there and I would take my pictures and I'd come back to the next event and I'd sell them, which was not really – to make money was more to to fuel my wrestling habit, you know, to pay for the tickets, pay for gas, pay for parking, <laughs> that sort of thing. Okay. And uh, I got caught by the fellow that worked for Jack Tunney, Elio Zarlenga, and instead of turning me in for doing something that was, I guess, a little illegal at the time, um, <laughs> so he said, uh, you know, we became friends, and he ended up introducing me to Jack, and uh, under the pretense that he wanted me to help him take pictures for the magazine. And uh, Jack said, well, we don't need another photographer, but we'll find something for the kid to do. And I ended up working on the ring crew and, uh, you know, basically uh, driving guys around, which was cool. And there you have it, folks. <clears throat> I'm going to keep this countdown going here with a the interview that we conducted back in October with former WWE, TNA, Ring of Honor. This woman has done it all. <clears throat> If I'm not mistaken, she is actually only the only woman we have on the countdown. The one and the only, Karma. Here she is as she discusses working and meeting the legendary Japanese legend, Aja Kong. You're no stranger to Japan either. You've uh, been tag team champions multiple times with the legendary Aja Kong. And I, I definitely have to ask, how was that like You know, being a tag team with her? Um, probably the most dominant women's tag team of all time, without a doubt. Uh, it was amazing, uh, no pun intended, because <laughs> not only were we, like, tag champions, you know, legit tag champions in, in women's wrestling, but we also got to tag together in Hustle, which was a really fun promotion where we got to break from our usual intimidating characters and play something extremely fun. So my run with her, both, you know... Serious and playful was was one of the highlights of my career. And you know, originally, you know, sh- when the, I 
I got an opportunity to come to Japan because of her, because, uh, you know, the problem she had with the All Japan Women's Office at the time, and she decided not to do a show, which opened up a spot, and they needed an A Kong, and that's why they named me Amazing Kong, so that there would be an A Kong on the card. And Coincidence? So, <laughs> right? So when I finally got to meet her, it was very I was very nervous because I didn't know how she would receive me this this newbie this you know guy gene that came in and just took the Kong name without you know asking her but she was so gracious I ran into her at a Korean barbecue one night at a steakhouse actually and she paid for me and my guests Aww. food on the way out and it was you know my jaw just dropped she was you know. Aww. Very, That's very so hospitable. Cool. Wasn't that Absolutely. cool? You know, the first time I met yeah. her, I went over and, and I, I said hello. You know, the, the usual. You know what you're supposed to do when you know you meet a veteran. And then of later course. on the way out, picked up a tab and you know, was like. And that was an enjoyable conversation. Karma. <laughs> Definitely one of mine, and I know Austin's favorite uh, people to talk to this year. Such mm-hmm. an intense competitor. You know, she. I'm hoping that we have not seen the last of this girl. You know, as far as being on television for WWE, TNA, Ring of Honor, whichever, where, wherever she. Or even Wrestle Kingdom. I mean, they've got a show coming up this weekend, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right, Austin? Yes, uh, this Sunday, actually. Wrestle Kingdom 9 with the headlining main event of. Hiroshi Tanahashi, the New Japan Pro Wrestling Heavyweight Champion of the World versus Okada. It's going to be one of the most, um, I mean, those guys, obviously. You talk about rivalries. Stone Cold versus The Rock and then some. This is a rivalry that's going to live in professional wrestling history. Besides that, Karma, I cannot tell you enough how much I love her. There is, I, I still think there's time for her to be in WWE. I really do because she, if she was there, she would probably, no, actually not probably undoubtedly be the most dominant uh, women's wrestler there. And not even, I'm, not, I'm not calling her a diva. She wouldn't be a diva. We've seen her just from the, the couple months she was there there before when she was in WWE, that she was anything but a diva. And that's the definition of karma. Um, not diva, but dominant. Definitely. And Nate, we got to get you back on there when we get her back on again. I don't know. Were you, no, you weren't there for that one, but we got to get you on there when she's on there so we can all have some fun because she was a lot of fun, definitely. I think she's, we can look to maybe bring her back again sometime in 2015, without a doubt. Yeah, I, I cannot wait for that. And, again, you know, we only had one woman on the countdown, but if you're only going to have one woman on the, on the spot, what a woman. And, you know, she was great and hospitable. I, wasn't, I didn't have a chance to be on the show, but I heard the interview, and it sounded like a lot of fun. Absolutely, absolutely. And we'll keep the countdown going, guys. We actually bring on a, another wrestling legend to kick off in the month of September. And, you know, he was working on writing a book. And what a better, t- better time to come on and promote it. But at this point, I actually, uh, we, we hear how he enjoyed working with The Undertaker. Here it is, the one and the only, the Ugandan giant, the mighty Kamala. Was such a fan of the work that you did with with Undertaker, and I really, I mean, obviously he was such an intimidating character and definitely unique at that time. I really feel the both of you guys really made that feud so enjoyable to watch and quite comical because of how you sold how how afraid you were of of the caskets. And <laughs> yeah, and I just I I would just I, I had to say I had to commentate I had to comment and say that I really enjoyed the work you did with. Uh, with Undertaker, I, I, people have said nothing but great things about him. Uh, what was your what was uh, maybe a share a memory of working back in Wembley with him, or even at the Survivor Series that year? Yeah, uh, working with Undertaker, it, it was great. See, I worked with him more than just Wembley in. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. So, but anyway, those were just my most memorable matches. And uh, televised matches, and he was just so, he was easy to work with. He had a real good attitude. He always was, you know, uh, he made me feel comfortable working with him. And I think I made him feel comfortable working with me. 
us on, you know, I was before his time, but mm-hmm. see if we work great together. We work great together. I'm and at the number 11 spot, number 11 spot will be wrestling legend, the Doctor of Desire, Dr. Tom Pritchard. Listen in as he speaks about an infamous Texas death match. We talk a lot about just the, the tradition of wrestling in Texas. You know, the Von Erichs and the Funks and the Guerreros and just a lot of great lineage that came out of that state. What do you think's in the water out there? Well, I think it was uh... – I didn't realize it at the time, uh, although I did know that um, uh, we saw some great wrestlers, but I didn't realize that we had some of the best in the business in the world at that time. And for whatever reason, Texas always had this aura about it as it was a rough and tough state, and uh, you know, it would be big, the match was called a Texas day, death match, uh, when, which anything went. And uh, there's a legendary story about Dory Funk Sr., and Iron Mike DiBiase in Amarillo, Texas, uh, they, they had a, te- a Texas death match that went five hours uh, into the night, and, and the angle was uh, DiBiase's wife uh, would, would would be listening to the to the match on the radio and get in her car and, and speed down to the arena, the sports arena in Amarillo, and, and hopefully the cops would, would stop her and, and get some publicity out of that, but that never happened. She got down to the arena <laughs> without being stopped. But, I mean, they did crazy and wacky stuff in Texas. And I think that bred a lot of creativity um, and original ideas. And as we prepare to enter into the top ten, almost there, we'll speak on 11 to 20. So thus far, I know Austin may have wanted to say something, may or not have, I don't know. Uh, Judging from Austin, knowing how, how many years I've already worked with him, that boy's always got something to say. So, Austin, <laughs> what you got to say, man? What you got to say? You know, I don't understand why you weren't really, really letting me and Nate speak about Kamala. I mean, WWE legend, a guy who's gone through a lot, has his own book now. Well, I believe his book's coming out You're getting a chance Arthur now, Arthur. son. What you complaining about? That's what I'm doing now. You should have done it before him. But, um, uh, you know, Kamala, <laughs> I mean, one of the <laughs> most legendary heels, uh, bad guys of all time, really and truly. And um, to, to be able to speak to, to, to him is... It's a, a moment in history I will never forget. You will never forget, and you still like to complain. No news hey, there. Really? Come on. Hey, Nate, uh, so what were your thoughts on, on getting to speak to the Ugandan giant earlier this year? Wasn't he just a nice oh, guy? He's such a nice man. Yeah, that was a really cool thing. And, uh, you know, I love talking to the legends because I think that a lot of times these, these guys and girls don't get their due, and I especially, you know, as a black man, it's, it was cool talking to Kamala because, you know, you talk about the history, and, and you know, it, it's not always a pretty history, you know, in the WWE or, you know, any of these other companies, especially at the time he came up in, but you didn't hear a lot of bitterness from him. Everything that's happened nope. to him, you know, the, the money, his health problems, you know, you would expect somebody in that situation to be angry or to be bitter, but you didn't hear that from Kamala, and, and, you know, I just want the best for him, and, and I had a great time talking with him. There you go. There you go. And, you know, it gets more intense as we're getting in there. We get in there to the uh, top ten spot, and we move on in here. And number ten goes back to just days after WrestleMania. This was a little tough to get. Uh, you know, as a lot of the legends, they they have different schedules. They they're, they're always traveling, doing their thing, and sometimes some like to go to bed early. Hey, I can I can dig it. And this particular wrestling legend, I had to, you know, set up a time that unfortunately uh, Austin was not able to be there with me, but I got to speak with the one and the only. He is part of the tag team of the Killer Bees, the one and the only Mr. Brian Blair. Listen in as he discusses how he was put with his tag team partner on the Killer Bees, Jim Brunzel. I, I'm curious, with the formation of the Killer Bees, how did that come come about? Well, well that uh, came about. Um, Hulk Hogan um, called me and he said, uh, "You've been just looking for a tag team." But there's a guy named uh, Jim Brunzel that I worked with because, of course. Uh, Vince Jr. just stole them from uh, from uh, Vern. Uh-huh. And, uh, the high flyers were 
<laughs> in the AWA with Byrne, and that was Greg Donnie and Jim Brunzel, and he said, uh, you want the tag team, he wants you, and he wondered if you wouldn't mind having Jim Brunzel as a tag team partner. I suggested that you guys would be good together. And I said, I don't know anything about Jimmy, but um, I heard he's just an awesome guy and uh, a great wrestler and worker and jumped like a, <laughs> like a, anybody. And it, 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 we kind of tell we met in Blanford, Canada, and, you know, the rest was history. And there you have it. At the number 10 spot, Brian Blair of the Killer Bees. He's another man that had a lot of great stories to tell, coming in the business, being trained by the uh, infamous trainer of trainers. Uh, what was his name? The one that trained Hogan? Uh, I lost my train of thought with that name. I know you're talking about, what yeah. Um, yeah I, oh, gosh, what's his name? I know you're talking about um, Hulk Hogan's trainer. You're talking about... Uh, oh, damn. Any help, any help, no. anybody, anybody? <laughs> Uh, but he was trained in that Matsuda. same group. Matsuda was Hero the one Matsuda. that trained him, Matsuda, and he was yeah. a guy that liked to break people before I and mean, really see if they really were worth getting into the business. Back then, you really had to prove yourself. You know, Brian Blair. He, he was. You know, we didn't we didn't talk for very long, but he definitely had a lot of his a lot of history, a lot of stories to tell. That he still competes from time to time, and he just enjoyed his time in wrestling and. and Working with the different promoters, obviously got to work with Vern, and got to work with uh, with Vince, of course. But um, moving into the next part of the countdown, at the number nine spot, well, he is a legend. I will give you that. He is a UFC legend. He is a part of the UFC Hall of Fame, and I am speaking about the one and the only, the Beast. Dan Severn. Listen in as he discusses how he got his start with WWE. What what led to you you being getting a call from from Stanford? Well, I'd say it was uh, I my first phone call I think was well maybe they called me first but I'm not certain if it was them or if it was WCW called me first. I, I did meet with them Eric Bischoff and uh, so I, I don't really recall the, the how the events went on. If, if uh, WWF called me first, then WCW, then WWF come back again, and and things, you know, basically they, they were in contact with both Ken Shamrock and I at the same time. Ken went to work for uh, uh, Vince almost a year before I did. He simply just said, you know, for X amount of dollars, I'm in. Well. I did not want to be exclusive, and and still to this day, I am the only non-exclusive professional wrestler ever in the WWF's history. You know, and I find that very intriguing, guys. For him to say that he was the only non-exclusive guy during an era when people were always jumping ship, WWE, WCW, and he talked about obviously when when they offered Ken and, and and Dan both, you know what do you guys think about that? I mean, in an era that kind of in that era specifically to be to be non exclusive, meaning he can compete anywhere he wants, not just WWE. Hey man, to be a beast like Dan Severn, you can work anywhere you want because that's just how you work. That's just how you are. I mean, Brock Lesnar can work anywhere he wants, and he's a uh, he says he's a beast too, right? Or what does he say? Yes, he's the um. The Beast Incarnate. The Beast Incarnate. Okay? Yeah, well, Dan Severn, he is w- one of my favorite people that I've ever spoken to in my entire life. And i got to say, just that little piece that um, Felix played um, is not even a fragment of all the stuff that he talked about in that interview. And if you get a chance, guys, definitely go back to pipebombradio.net and uh, check out the Dan Severn interview. It's It's so full of information I cannot even begin to tell you. Any thoughts, Nate? I mean, uh, you know, obviously the nickname says it all. He is a beast. And it's interesting because, you know, as much as he was an attraction back during that era, we see now the kind of melding of worlds between MMA and uh, professional wrestling. 
And it's yeah. like, you know, even a guy, if you look at CM Punk going the other way from wrestling to MMA, uh, you know, just kind of the influence both sports have had on each other. And a guy like Dan Severn, a guy like Ken Shamrock, you know, these are guys that were at the forefront of that. Very true. Very true. You know, I mean, we had when we had uh, Ken on last year, and even earlier this year, come to think of it, but, I mean, Ken was always a joy to speak to. You know, he, he, he always talked about wanting to have another run. Dan... On the other hand, he, it's not so much that he didn't he didn't have any desire to go back to WWE. He seemed like he was much more at peace in his life. At least that's the impression I got from him. You know, um, but that being said, you know, I don't think we've heard the last from from the Beast himself. I could definitely see him coming back for sure. You know, if you guys are listening in tonight, and want to actually see him come back? Let us know. We'll we'll, we'll look to make that happen this year. But we'll keep the countdown going. One of my favorite guests, I'm a little biased because I got to speak to him, but um, <laughs> it was last summer, and he was promoting his very first iPay-Per-View, Internet pay-per-view, and he spoke about a topic that I had to ask. You know, I'm sure he'd been asked hundreds of times, but uh, at the number eight spot is WWE Hall of Famer Booker T. And he spoke briefly about working with the – Sensational one herself, Sensational Sherry. So up on the banana peel and, you know, get Sherry Martell as a manager, you know, that was um, even, you know, more icing on the cake for us right there. Definitely solidified Amen. us and made us major players, you know, right from the beginning. You know, uh, so so right there. That was the beginning of Harlem Heat, Harlem, really, um, title raise, um, you know, began to happen, you know, and I, I really don't think we would have been as successful um, without Sherry Martell. I honestly do uh, believe that, you know, so – Definitely, she was the fuel to the fire. And um, as far as memories go, man, I can't, I can't even tell you, man. There's so many of them. You know what I mean? So Absolutely. many memories, uh, you know, with Sherry Hotel and Booker T and Stevie Ray being on the road, going up and down the roads, you know, almost starting riots in a lot of those times. You know, <laughs> um, it, was, it, was, it was a great time. You know, he kept it short and sweet. But, you know, I know Booker, we haven't seen the last of Booker on the show. Booker is somebody that I'm going to keep trying to get on. I mean, he's kind of the kind of people that I would think, in my opinion, with Austin anyway, is that he'd be the kind of guy that I'd like to have on more than once, twice, maybe three times. No doubt about it. You know, Booker T, mentioning uh, him, he actually made his common carry return on main event. i got to say, one of the best things I've witnessed and heard all year long, Booker T on commentary uh, is Shucky, amazing. Oh, quack, quack. There you go. Tell me you did not just say that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. I stole your thunder, son. Should have said like Booker T. Let me do it over again. Tell me you did not just say that. Is that better, Nate? Wow. Uh, Austin's voice is changing, Nate. Can you believe that? <laughs> uh, a young a young Padawan is turning into a dead eye. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, hey, so I wouldn't be laughing. You the one that didn't introduce yeah, Booker laughing. T right at the beginning of the interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we didn't have to play that, so and I didn't play that. Sucker. <laughs> but uh, we're gonna move into this next one here, which is also a WWE Hall of Famer. He was brought on earlier this year, and was we just we we brought him on twice, but the particular clip that I'm playing was. The moment he talked about when he got to wrestle his hero and take the title from him, the I, the one and the only, the Russian bear, Ivan Koloff, talks about defeating Bruno. If you could take us back to that night when you actually got to wrestle Bruno for the title, I mean, what was going through your mind? I mean, do you remember the, the crowd reaction and just kind of, you know, set the mood and kind of tell us what it was like for you back then? Well, uh, by this time, of course, I'd uh, had quite a few matches, uh, quite a few years of uh, wrestling, even though this is just 69, and I've been graduated from wrestling school about uh, 1962. So uh, oh, nice. I started yes, getting yeah. a few matches. Uh, uh, but by the time I got there, you know, I had six, seven years under my belt. I ended up uh, wrestling in Montreal area for two years before I got there. And... Uh, uh, of course, as, as Ivan Koloff became Canadian champion and got uh, referred to uh, uh, McMahon's and the WWF, and they ended up uh, 
being set up there to uh, wrestle Bruno. Oh, you can you, you can imagine the excitement and the nervousness that I had, and uh, yeah. just the idea that I was going to be able to wrestle against my hero. You know, but uh, yeah. for that the whole eight ten months of wrestling, sixty nine through the seventy, uh, winning a few matches but never winning the belt. Left and went to Australia on a tour. Uh, got a message when I was back in Hawaii, uh, enjoying myself, uh, to come back to New York and wrestle Bruno again and uh, take somebody's place and uh, ended up uh, coming back and winning the belt. That night, uh, needless to say, <laughs> uh, you can imagine a sellout crowd. It was, uh, Bruno was just so loved that he was a legend. And he is a legend, still is, uh, as far yeah. as in wrestling. And uh, the people loved him. And for uh, just the nervousness that I had of, you know, seeing the crowd walking out there. By this time, I had built myself from a, a guy that was uh, 200 pounds up to 300 pounds and was been pressing, you know, 500, was squatting 500. So I was fairly strong myself, and uh, I was confident because I had won the Canadian belt and had been wrestling a lot of main event guys from Japan to throughout Canada ended up uh, uh, feeling pretty confident, but I still remember nervous. And I must say, thinking about it after, I was thinking to myself, man, what a mean guy. Here I am winning the belt from uh, my my hero. You know, I felt bad for about two seconds there. You know, but I understood that Bruno at that time had been champion seven and a half years, and he had a lot of injuries. And... Uh, I believe that uh, that helped me a lot to become champion. And the fact that uh, he probably needed recovery here at time to uh, from his injuries, and uh, I, I got him at a good time and, and won the belt. And cause he ended up winning it back again, holding it for several more years. So. And we'll move quickly into a short clip of the number six spot, which will go to. The genius Lanny Poffo coming on the show this past October to talk about how the genius gimmick was created. Going with the genius gimmick, um, did you whose whose idea was it to 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 wear the cap and gown? Was that something of yours, or could it have been that you may have had a different costume for the character? Uh, Randy and I were, you know, talking and talking about it, and um, you know, we were discussing what kind of a heel I could be and then finally Randy presented it to Vince and uh, and my idea was to call me Boy Genius because that's the kid in the classroom that's so obnoxious, oh teacher oh Mr. Carter, oh you know, he's got his hand up all the time <laughs> so, uh, so, Vince, so Vince says we'll call him the Genius Lanny Popo and then we'll just shorten it to the Genius so it'll be a transition like we're not trying to put one over on anybody so, um, okay. so I told Vince, the hell with you, I'm leaving. No, I didn't do that. I just said, okay. <laughs> go ahead, Austin. You know you want to correct me on something I said, so go ahead and do it. It'll make you feel better. Who did I say was a WWE Hall of Famer and wasn't? Ivan Koloff. You feel better now? <laughs> I feel, I forgot that he wasn't a WWE Hall of Famer. He should be. That doesn't that goes without saying, but no, he's you not about one it? And, you know, besides being a WWE Hall of Famer, I mean, a few, you, you know what? I just said he was a WWE Hall of Famer. Yet, he's not one yet, but he will be in the future because he is the only man in history who um, will the third WWE champion of all time. Um, uh, you know, beat Bruno San Martino, become the third ever WWE champion. And that's um, uh, that says something that makes a legend, definitely. And Ivan Koloff to, to beat a guy like Bruno San Martino after his long, long reign as the champion, that's uh, that's legend status, without a doubt. Nate, any comments on, on getting the chance to speak to Lanny Poffo this past fall? Uh, well, would be past fall, spring, around the spring, but definitely fall. This was definitely one of the interviews that, man, I I just had a great time talking with Lanny. You know, it, it's somebody that we've seen on TV for a while, you know, for years, uh, and the thing I liked about our conversation was that, you know, we've, we tried as much as possible to focus on Lanny because a lot of times people have Lanny on just to talk about his brother, and we all love the Macho Man. We yeah. all love Randy. But, you know, I think it, it's 
valuable and it's worthwhile to talk to Landon because he had a great career in his own right. And, uh, you know, it, it was cool talking to him, and you could tell just how proud he is of his family and how proud he is of his place in wrestling. And, you know, I, I hope that that man finds his way into a uh, Hall of Fame in the future, much like Ivan Kolov. There you go. And, you know, we are in the top. We're rounding at the top five, guys. We've done already six to 20. So far, so good, guys. You guys enjoying the countdown so far? Austin, Yeah, Nate? so far, so good. I, I, I may cool. have uh, – I'm going to be like uh, Austin. I'm going to wait till we finish because I've got a couple people that I think might have made my top 20, but I can't argue with any of the, the people that have made it so far. Okay. We will move in to the countdown now at the number five spot. It is a short clip, but a memorable one, because the gentleman we had on did something I didn't expect him to do. We had him on here. He is former WWE Intercontinental Champion, Tag Team Champion. He is not the Mountie, but he did sing another song. He sang the Rougeau song. Hang tight for a second, guys. If you talk about Jimmy doing some of the music for the guys, did he do the theme song for the Rougeau Brothers? Because I thought that was one of the best themes back in the day, the All-American <laughs> Boys. Then, We're All-American Boys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. We we don't like heavy metal. We don't like rock and roll. All we like to listen to is Barry Manilow. <laughs> hey! <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was great. Yeah, that was fun. But yeah, Jimmy did write that song, and he wrote. He also wrote "We're Not the Mounties" and uh, and all really? that stuff. And uh, Jimmy wrote every song I ever had in the business. Plus, you'd be surprised to see that how many awesome. boys. Yeah, there you go, guys. Jacques Rougeau, <laughs> one of awesome. my favorites. Thus far, you know, he <laughs> – you could not include that. You can't not include that. I mean, the man sang a, a little piece of his song, of his theme song. Come on now. <laughs> but uh, I know that was a thrill for you, Nate. Austin, any any thoughts on speaking to Jacques? Miss you, yeah, Jacques. I think that's right? right? Yeah, What's a lot that? of thoughts to you about Jacques, Jacques Rougeau. I mean, you know, definitely giving us a rundown – uh, the, his theme song uh, was uh, was really nice, you know, because um, being a part of that was pretty damn cool. And uh, I would love to have him back on in the future, but I think we talked about we talked about it every basically you know, everything. But um, there's always just a little bit of stuff to you know more to go over with um, each well, guest. Well, if he's got something that he's going to be pr- pr- promoting, you know, we can look at that. And, but yeah, Jacques was definitely one of my favorites. We hit on a lot of topics. You're right. And now. We move into the number four spot. <laughs> he is a wrestling legend, and I can guarantee you, because I saw him get inducted. Inducted it. He was in the 2009 Hall of Fame. He is the one, the only, Mr. Kevin Von Erich, at the number yes. four spot, giving his thoughts on getting into politics. Have you ever thought about, you know, running for office or something like that? Ooh, that's a good question. No. Uh, I'll tell you, I, I'm, I am opinionated, and I shouldn't talk out on Twitter like I do sometimes, but I, I only use common sense. I never single anyone out, I, I, but I try not to be political at all. And, you know, that's it's a game that I hate to watch and going on. I think it seems like our country is just, just so divided. And, all, and, and it's almost like it's encouraged. And that's what really bothers me. It's like it's almost like you realize how dangerous it could be. People marching down the street in New York, saying they want dead cops. It's just how did this get whipped up into this? We have a black president. It's I would just think that I, I played on the football team that was eighty percent black, and every one of those guys were like a brother to me. And we we could joke with each other, like pop the towel on any other butts, any. It's we were and saying if you keep it funny, it's funny. And uh, I don't know if there. I just have a hard time believing there are so many racist. I sure don't know one. I know if somebody says a comment like that, people. If somebody made a racial comment, whoever's standing around, people start filtering away and leaving. It's just nobody wants to be around that type. Of- Very good topic, and it's true. You know, nowadays. And that makes a whole lot of sense on why Kevin decided to move, you know, move away from the riffraff and the, may- and the mayhem, and just live the simple life. 
you know. We didn't just talk about wrestling. We talked about <laughs> What was it that you said that was Austin that he said he was working on something about not having to pay his bills or something like that? Yeah, he was actually, and me and him have that, that same bond, yet I have to, I don't know where to start with that, you know, where to actually start beginning with sustaining as much energy as possible, but, you know, me and him, you know, uh, love that green, organic lifestyle. <laughs> and I know it was a thrill for you, Nate, getting the chance to speak to a great man like uh, like uh, Kevin. Any thoughts on, the, on that on that particular interview in general? Yeah, that was definitely a highlight for me. Anybody that knows me knows that you know world class championship wrestling was one of my favorite promotions of all time, and Kevin Von Erich was one of my favorite wrestlers from that promotion. So talking to him was was really cool, uh, just as a from a fan standpoint. But then, like you just heard from that clip, you know, we didn't just talk about wrestling. We talked about you know some social issues, some political topics. We talked about energy and conservation, and of course. We talked about his sons, uh, Ross and Marshall. So, you know, if you missed that interview, go back and check it out because I think it's it's a really good interview with a wrestler that, uh, you know, he's not just talking about stuff that happened from bell to bell. He's talking about some really cool, really interesting things that all of us can relate with. There you go. We're closing in on the top three, gentlemen. We're there in the top three. And the next one, number three spot. <laughs> One of Austin's forever favorites, forever in his life, without a doubt. Remember, remember, guys, he loves me. He said it. He is the one and the only, Mr. Blackjack Mulligan. And but this particular clip, I, I thought it was really cool because he talked about. And he even started to spout off the the promo, a, pr- a particular promo he used to cut. I'll let you guys take a listen. You know, Blackjack, I actually wanted to bring up something because Austin had mentioned a moment that was really something that really he, he just really loved. One of your, your promos you cut. Austin, do you do you recall how that how that promo went? Do you want to try and say it and see if it oh, uh, what, what Blackjack has to say? <laughs> no, no, I remember you, you, I mean, you, you were coming in to, there. No, no, it's cool. You were coming in to, um, I believe it was, um, it was Mid-Atlantic and you were just, I know Gordon Soley was uh, was the one uh, basically talking about it, saying the gun singers coming back to town, and Bobby Heenan uh, brought you guys in, and then you started basically, you know, take over. And I can't remember exactly what you said. I remember I watched it last week, but um, you're basically you're telling how it was going to be. Oh, I was just like, it's, it's like Black Jack Mulligan here, stop everything you're doing, get Mama from the kitchen, get all them dirty yes. mouth kids in there with yes. that television set <laughs> and watch it because it is the Black Jack time and Bobby Heenan and I are all here. Yeah, I said get them dirty mouth kids in the end of the TV. <laughs> and I just, it just caught on real quick and I used that for a long, long time. It was kind of like my opening <laughs> opening thing. And Heenan yeah. was letting me... He and was sitting there looking at me like I'm stupid. But what, what, what did you, where did you get that? And I said, hey, I'll handle the promos. <laughs> we got a fight on the TV there. Me and he and of course, we, we were having fun. God bless him. You know, Blackjack is one of the one of the all-time great storytellers, and I know that cutting that promo made Austin's night that night. And it, he was just he's just a joy to speak to. He's really a good, kind-hearted man with a lifetime of memories of stories he can tell. I'm surprised, if he hasn't already, that the man hasn't wrote a book. If oh, he, he, he did. I don't know if he has, true. but he needs to. Yeah, he did. True Lies, true lies and Alibis. He did? Wow, I missed that Yes, one. he did. Available oh. on Amazon okay. for a very steep price, but it's worth the money I spent on it, and uh, it's still available. I believe it goes for... You I, bought I, it? You know, last time I, yeah, absolutely. You go, Black Jack Mulligan... Yeah, me and him are me and him are buddies, man. And uh, Blackjack, <laughs> I love dearly to death. And uh, oh my God, yeah, yeah go he's back my and listen to that for, interview this past August. Austin did is yeah. correct. He did say he loves Austin. <laughs> he loves me, and you know what? And I and I say that I'm gonna put it on a T-shirt. Blackjack Mulligan loves me because you know uh, I guess <laughs> there you, know. you go, folks. <laughs> and if you guys don't know Blackjack Mulligan, he is the uh, the grandfather of. The great Bo Dallas and uh, the equally great Bray Wyatt. But, I mean, he's my favorite guest of all time to speak to, and uh, that would never change. One of the greats of, uh, one of the greatest wrestlers and one of the greatest promo guys of all time. 
Blackjack Mulgrim. There you have it, folks. At the number two spot. My goodness. I'm getting nervous. Who's going to be number two? My goodness gracious. Well, <laughs> we had a beast on earlier today. Earlier today. Earlier in the, in the countdown. Tonight, we will, in this number two spot, will be an animal. George the animal, that is. Listen in as the animal, George Steele, talks about how he got involved. He wasn't really a fan of professional wrestling, but how he got his start in it. At what age did you kind of start watching professional wrestling? And was that at a point where you were, it kind of pulled you in and and you wanted to be a wrestler, if that makes sense? (laughs) Totally wrong. I was never a wrestling fan. Oh, okay. I never watched it. A few times when it come out, I'd chuckle at it and move on. I was a football guy. Uh, gotcha. Had no in- interest at all in professional wrestling. Uh, graduated from college in 1961, making $4,300 a year with a blown knee from football. Had two okay. children, a third one on the way. Wow. Uh, obviously, I needed some money. Yes, sir. A friend of mine was a huge wrestling fan. And he talked me into calling the lo- uh, the local promoter one night, late at night. We were out looking for, I was looking for a job as a bouncer in a bar. At about 1 o'clock, I called Burt Ruby, the local promoter. Mm-hmm. Woke him up, told him I wanted to be a wrestler, and he invited me over to his house the next day. I had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> so I knock on the door, Oak Park, Michigan. Burt Ruby answers the door, takes one look at me. Now, I know what it looked like. And he said... <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> I thought, what am I getting into here? <laughs> Anyhow, I went in, I met his mother-in-law and his wife and his three kid, two kids and kind of relaxed a little bit. Then he took me into his office. Again, I know nothing about wrestling. And in the conversation, he asked me to take off my jacket and my shirt. And when he saw the hairy body, he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, again, I'm wondering, <laughs> what am I getting into? And... Uh, from there, uh, he explained to me a little bit about wrestling, and we decided that I would put a mask on and wrestle locally in a lot of fundraising-type things and a few house shows. Um, I would use the name The Student. We put a cap and gout on me because I was learning the business, and I was off and running uh, uh, all around Michigan, uh, a little bit into uh, Ohio and uh, Wisconsin, And there you have it, folks. A little bit of insight on the great interview we had with George the Animal Steel. Definitely a great Christmas treat, if I do say so myself. A very mm-hmm. eloquent speaker, very, very intelligent man who, you know, he just kind of stumbled upon it and, and, and made something with it. And as he, even, as he even got older into the 80s, he was already past his prime. But he continued on and, and made an you know incredible career for himself, until he retired, of course, and he still, and what was funny is if you listen into that interview, he was still a teacher. He was still teaching, I believe, at, the, at was it college or high school, Austin? He was high school. He was still teaching high school football and still wrestling on the weekends. So, I mean, mm-hmm. he, he, you know, I, George was awesome. I, I love speaking with him. Uh, if he's got something else to promote in the future, I'd yep. love to have him back. Within within the the first year of him actually getting to the um, WWE, within the first or second year, he was already in the uh, the championship uh, title belt. You know, he was in the main event. I mean, the first the the first or second year that he actually got into WWE, I mean, uh, he was there. And um, uh, this, I, you know, Bruno, actually mentioning of all people. yeah, yeah, mentioning this above all the stuff that we, that, uh, we talked about in that interview. But the time, and I, I love this moment in the interview where. He, you know, we begin to talk about how did the turnbuckles taste. He's like, oh, you want to learn how they <laughs> taste it, or you want to learn how I began to eat them. I'm like, well, I want to learn a little bit of both. And he <laughs> definitely said it. <laughs> and with that, oh, my goodness gracious, Uh-oh. we need one of these. As we prepare for the number one spot, Who is at the number one spot? Well, 
Woo, Mercy Daddy. We have to go back to the one and the only Mr. Jimmy Valiant. And here, and the clip that I've chosen, he talked about some of the managers he got to work with, as well as the McMahons, as well, Mr. McMahon Sr. and Jr. Take it away, Boogie Woogie Man. It, you touched on, there, there's so many people that you've gone and worked with, whether it be managers or people that you've wrestled. Uh, a topic I wanted to touch on was some of the some of the all-time great managers that you've had the opportunity to work with. You've worked with Bobby the Brain Heenan. You've worked with, uh, you, like you said, you worked with Ernie Roth. And then I believe you were in, correct me if I'm wrong on this, I believe I've seen that you were inducted by uh, Captain Lou. Captain Lou, you bet. Yes, yes, yeah, Captain Lou, uh, uh, um, uh, he, him, and uh, Johnny, and uh, yeah, we were all inducted in, in the WWE Hall of Fame, 1996, and uh, man, 18 years ago, I guess, and almost 19 years ago, and so we was one of the early classes, and I'm very fortunate uh, to, uh, you know, I'm honored, and and uh, yes, Captain Lou was uh, my Johnny and my manager, and and um, it was a, uh, a great ride, man. You know, I worked for. Um, Three times in New York, uh, 1970 and 1974, and then in uh, 78, and and uh, uh, all for Vince McMahon Sr. You know, uh, the Vince McMahon uh, you see today, that's Junior, that's his son. And, of course, the first time I came in, 1970, um, uh, to work uh, at New York, uh, Handsome Jimmy Valiant, um, that's uh, uh, Vince Jr. was uh, still in in uh, college, or he wasn't part of it at that time. And I came back in seven, '74 with Johnny, and um, um, uh, the first time was when Ernie Roth, the Grand Wizard, uh, managed me. But um, the second time, um, uh, he had sold our contra- my contract, and then we signed Johnny as the Valiant Brothers, Luscious Johnny and Handsome Jimmy, and um, we uh, won the the WWF. Uh, tag team, uh, world tag team champ uh, straps, and held them at that time the longest ever. It was uh, like uh, 14 months, 15 months, and and um, I'm sure the, the people's had them longer by now. But at that time, it was a, a record. But um, we um, um, uh, at that at that time, then uh, Vince was uh, uh, junior, uh, the one now. Uh, God bless him. He he. Um, he uh, was uh, uh, commentating and doing, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, interviews and TV stuff. And then in 78, he was doing the same. And then, of course, um, he took over. And, and uh, man, he just uh, reinvented the whole, the whole world, brother, man. And he's cooking. So uh, God bless him and, and his father. But um, his dad was uh, the one that uh, I actually worked for. Um, and and um, I was very honored to... Uh, when uh, they, they put uh, me and Johnny and Captain Lou and, and the same class, um, they put um, Pat Patterson and, and um, uh, also uh, they put uh, uh, Jimmy Fly, uh, Jimmy Snuka and uh, Superfly and uh, and uh, Killer Kowalski in uh, in uh, 1976. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was a lot of fun. Woo, mercy, Daddy! I have to say that was a lot of fun. I can't do it as good as I did when I first knew that I was going to bring him on. But what an incredible countdown, guys. It was not easy to come down to these top 20s, top 20 choices mm. that we chose because we had some incredible guests this year. Brother From Man, From talking to the Black Jack in the beginning to, to George the Animal. My goodness gracious. Mm. Cannot stop to mention that um, uh, Jimmy Valiant, without a doubt, I think deserves the number one spot. Uh, just being the person that he is, the attitude that he has, the personality that he, you know, just just out, sends out to wherever you are. I mean, you don't have to be in front of him to feel it. He has charisma like nobody else. And uh, uh, Jimmy Valiant's one of the, um, the best of all time. Yes, he is. Mercy Daddy. Is that good? Did I do all I can? No, 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 no. you got to go and give it a Woo, Mercy Daddy. I can, and the go. reason why I can't, because nobody can do it better than Jimmy Valiant himself. No, of course not. Any thoughts, Nate? Yeah, of course. Very awesome. Uh, shout out to the Boogie Woogie Man, rightfully deserving of that top spot. And you're right, man. You're like, I did not envy you for uh, going through these interviews over the past year and, and narrowing them down to 20. 
because, uh, you know, I can't argue with any of the choices. I think they're all excellent in interviews. There are a couple people that I I really enjoyed talking to them that, that didn't make the list. Uh, okay. uh, you know, I, I remember our conversation with Raymond Rowe. That was a really cool chat that we had. Uh, yes, the conversation we, we had with uh, Chaz and Tugboat Taylor was one of my favorites. And then uh, I think this may have been one of the first shows I was on, but it, it sticks out as a show that I really enjoyed was the night we had uh, Little Egypt on, and then we followed her up with Brian Shields talking about the uh, 30 Years of WrestleMania book. I thought that was a really cool show. You know what? Then we'll go on a limb. I, I can go out on a limb and tell you now, as as the boss, I will give those – the uh, uh, what is it? What were the ones that we were going to call them, Austin? Honorable the ones mention. that we couldn't ju- honorable mention. There you go. Honorable mention choices given by Nate. He, I and who who better to choose them? There you go. Mm. Honorable you know, mentions mentioning right there. They Nate were great choices too. Yeah, and they've actually mentioned Raymond Rowe, who's actually all. I mean, he's doing beyond awesome in his recovery. I mean, I expect him to be back uh, in action. Over at Ring of Honor with his um uh, his amazing tag team partner Hanson, who is uh, dominating the scene. But when you got when you have two guys like Raymond Rowe and and Hanson as a tag team war machine, the only thing they can do is dominate. They're, they're the definition of it. So I guess put down your Webster dictionary. Uh, I'll tell you then right you know right here right now they're going to take over the tag team division in uh, 2015. And I just have to say. Uh, on uh, to myself and to Austin sitting down to choose this, we deserve this. So I'm going to go ahead and give this to us right now. <laughs> oh, that ended quick. Rude. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we deserve the applause, Austin. We worked our asses off this year. We welcomed a new team member that's been helping us kick ass and take names the rest of the remainder of the year. And Bright Lights, Big City, looking forward to 2015. We've got some great great uh, people lined up already. Uh, but we'll get to that a little bit later. We'll get to that a little bit later. I got something to say. And I've been saving this since I saw it you Monday. It, 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 my, it made my eyes bleed. It made me go deaf momentarily. Why in the blue hell, why, why, why do you promote something so heavily, so highly that it's a make-or-break situation, and then a month later it's irrelevant? What the hell was the point? Hmm. Why the hell do you bring these guys back so soon? Why not bring it, test it along, bring it along a little bit, have Vince run the show over in the meantime for a couple of weeks, because you knew Triple H was going to come back anyway. It almost it's a slap in the face. What the hell was the point of having them taken off TV for a couple of weeks for a hiccup, and then they're now they're back? I am not thrilled with that idea. I think it's a dumb idea. I'm sorry, I don't agree with it because you put well, such a, you know, a high profile match together, and now mm-hmm. what? Is, what was the point Good. of it? What was the point of Great. it? Great. I'm I'm actually glad you feel that way, but your the answer to your question is one word. Power. Oh, Lord. No, it's called that bored, being bored. They had nothing better to do. So bring them back to TV, folks. You got it. The future is bright. I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed with that. Mm. Very mm. much so. The future is bright. Yeah, no, just like the undisputed future of, of the WWE, Seth name. Rollins, who's going to be the man in 2015. He's been the man in 2014. I mean, in 2014, he's going to be the man in 2015. In every single year going forward, because he is. Uh, hey, you know, you we know, could have actually gotten rid of this guy, and and then end up being a slap in our face because he had to come back and be like, "I told you, I'd be back." This fool, yeah, I talk, can't believe talk it. about stipulations that didn't last. Whatever, whatever happened to uh, Austin leaving the show? That that's a stipulation. <laughs> well, you that know why? Really, uh, if you watch Survivor Series, you would have saw that Dolph Ziggler cheated and that vigilante Sting. Who counted the one, two, three? Yes, yeah, but and, who and got no, the one, he, two, you know, and, he, and Sting. I, I don't. The last time I checked, Sting wasn't a referee. No, I didn't say he was, but the referee counted the one, two, three. Yeah, but the referee was um, he wasn't real, you know, and the Dolph Ziggler. <laughs> um, uh, the guy, he was the yeah, one you know, who um, actually was a part of the match, not that. Seth Rollins, you know what, Armstrong, it, dude. Seth Rollins has had his foot on 
the bottom rope, and the referee, and the anyways, referee was, I can't remember his name, did not. And anyways, Austin, see there's that. no point in arguing that now because the ridiculous dynamic duo are back in town. So they ain't a They're reason a to duo. argue about it because the ridiculous duo are back in town and on TV yet again. You got to yeah. mention, I mean, there's Triple H, there's Stephanie, there's the, the, the largest athlete in the world, the big show. You got Jamie Noble the and, uh, and what'd you say? The Stooges. Trader. He did what was right. He, he did what was smart. He did what would get his family food on the table. And if you can't understand that, you can't understand Obviously anything. Obviously, he has a totally understandable. <laughs> I'm going to pose a question over to Nate because he's been waiting patiently and, and wanted to voice his opinion. By all means, the microphone is all yours. Please Your take it away. Your opinion doesn't matter, Nate. Just Shut like up. Yeah, so, uh, Common courtesy, rude. Yeah. Don't be rude. Yeah, this this is how we're gonna end the year, Austin, on on, on the bad note. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I thought. Uh, I mean, we all knew that the the authority was gonna come back in one way or another. Eventually. But you're right, Felix. It was too soon, and not only was it too soon, but Stephanie and Hunter showed up the same night at the end of the show, and it's like you can't even exactly. wait to bring them back. You know, I think everything was rusted a little bit too quickly. I, I like the segment with Edge and with Christian, but it just seemed yep. like it was built up out of nowhere. Like all of a sudden, Cena and Edge are best friends, and Cena's like, "No, I, I, I can't have you do this to Edge." And where were all the other good guys? Uh, you know, by the way, where was Ryback? Where were the Usos? Nobody else could come out and help. Ryback is too busy making his poetry backstage, and I gotta <laughs> tell you, Edge. First off, would he's you not hiding, you Rock. Question, Nate? You know what? Felix, I'm talking to Nate right now. Stop being rude. I'm never rude. <laughs> but Nate, I was going to tell you that did you, Edge, the radar superstar, Adam Copeland, he's a father. Would you want it to him you know, to be curb stomped into the ground? Or would you want the authority to be brought back? I think, you know, John Cena making the, the authority, reinstating the authority, the true power of the WWE back in action would have saved Edge. I mean, uh, that's the the point about it all. No, what no, made it not so really. bad is like you, you, like you knew Rollins was going to go back on his word anyway, so it made no sense at the end of the day. Like, I understand that Ed, you don't want Ed to be hurt, but it's like you got one guy versus the needs of the company. And if the authority was so bad that you had to go to these measures to get rid of them in the first place, I thought that, you know, the stakes that were, were up last night on Raw is like, yeah, you care about Ed, but – it seemed a little too quick, a little too convenient, and now we got Triple H and Stephanie back. Thank dun, God. Dun, dun. Thank you, God. I am praising <laughs> the Lord. You know, it's a better days are on the horizon. And, uh, you know, talk about uh, yeah, you and know, Austin so saying happy days are here again. Austin. And in the meantime, he's sitting there being a bootlicker. Go ahead and lick their he, boots, he man. They a... need a bootlicking. No, you know what they're saying? Booty, Austin. <laughs> The, the authorities back, that means uh, the vigilante's going to come back and have to uh, take care of it. So get ready for that man called Sting again. Oh, He'll be back. Wait, what, what name? I thought, I thought he wasn't the man, the man called Sting. I thought he was the man, the vigilante. That's the, the name that they gave him, him sure in WWE. Like, He'll always be known as a man called Sting. Sting so. But, you know, you mentioned uh, better days on the horizon. You got to talk about Daniel Bryan, the, uh, yeah. the GOAT. Coming back to the Royal Rumble 2015, the and I goat. hope the authority has something to say about that next week when they're back on Raw. He said, he literally called him and tell me you did not just tell me you did not just say that. <laughs> I guess he did because he ain't answering. <laughs> but uh, you know, Daniel, it's good. I'm I'm happy for him. I I was really beginning to wonder if his career truly was going to be over. All things, all joking aside. That kind of in, in, injury, excuse me, is nothing to joke about. It's very serious. It's taken out a lot of people mm-hmm. in their prime. So the fact that he has been given a second chance and able to come back, it, it's a blessing. More power to him. I hope you know he can get back to the top of the mountain and and become the 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 A plus world champion that we know he could have been. Mm-hmm. You know, Felix, Daniel Bryan. I'm going to tell you like it is. He's one of if you call him a B-plus wrestlers. player, that's a slap in the face because you don't obviously like him as much as I thought you did. So shut up. 
Daniel Bryan is one of the best wrestlers in the in the world. I mean, he's one of the best to walk in the squared circle, no doubt about it. But if you think he's going to come back without any uh, roadblocks, like he has been, oh, uh, you know, been in his way since you know all this this year, you are sorely mistaken. Because I got to tell you, the Authority they have a few, uh, you know, Joey Mercury and um and Jamie Noble. A few this dude is in the way. Please, the hoaxer was taking care of those two last week. I didn't see that. I, I didn't. I didn't. I don't know what you're talking about, but I mean, you know, maybe you're just. Please, you're just, hoaxer you know, was taking care of those two little knuckleheads all by himself. I don't know what you <laughs> saw, but I mean, I saw Jimmy Noble and. I'm pretty sure and, I'm not uh, the only Jimmy one who saw it. A million other fight, people did the too. Five their lives. <laughs> but you know what? What's done is done. They're gonna get theirs. Sting's going to tear him a new one, and there you go. And if it ain't Sting, I'm pretty sure Daniel wouldn't mind taking another crack at that big-ass nose. And, yes, I said big-ass nose, big-ass schnoz, whatever you want to call it. This is a family show. We have to be nice here, okay? Okay. Oh, you never know. <laughs> Got me choking here for a second. Big honking nose. How about that? You like that better? I love it. No, actually, no, I I'm don't sure love you it. I'm sure you do. That's pretty disrespect- disrespectful to say about Triple H. But, you know, it's better than and saying, we've got a, you know, we've, the other way We've got surprises in store coming up next week uh, as we approach the new year. Obviously, judging if you guys have seen the pictures and so forth, the new changes, new look. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> oh, I'm getting all <clears throat> choked up here. Hold on one second. I'm back. Phenomenal. Okay. Deck the halls, right? Up. Get some cough drops. <laughs> Uh, this from the guy who would be coughing on the damn, on the darn interviews I can hear in the background. Mm. Thank that you very much. That was my much. dog barking, okay? Gosh. Did I mention my well, dog? Well, you've, you've got a really sore throat then. You better quit telling him to quit barking so much then. But um, let's go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and play a quick clip of who our guest will be next week. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a long road, been a long trying time to get this man, but rightfully so, he's a busy man. He is the best there is. He is the best there was. He is the best there ever will be. He is gonna he is WWE Hall of Famer Bret Hart and he will be with us next week. What the you got to say about that? The excellence of that execution. Every other synonym that you can say he is. Well well positive ones I'm talking or about. Been there, Brett done that. Hart. Yeah, you know, he's been there, done that, is an understatement. And to have a guy like Bret Hart kick him off 2015 on Pipe Bomb Radio, that's a big deal. That's a huge deal. Any thoughts, Nate? Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't wait to uh, speak to the hitman. You know, we've we've been talking about this for a while behind the scenes, and it's cool that we can finally uh, share this with the listeners, man. And, and I can't think of a better way to start the year. And, and I guarantee that this is going to be – one of the best interviews there ever was, one of the best interviews there ever is, and one of the best interviews there ever will be. Nicely done. Nicely put. Guys, we do have a caller calling in. Hopefully um, not one of Austin's fans, maybe one of ours, Nate. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, caller, you're live now with Austin, Nate, and myself. How you doing? Hey, guys. Hey, is this Elio Wins Canella? Hey, how's it going? Hey. <laughs> yeah, you know, we were just talking about you. I was talking about you on the Felix um where is it, a couple of days ago I'm like we got some awesome T shirts on, on the Pipe Bomb Radio's um uh, website, Pipe Bomb Radio dot net. Yeah. Like we need to make an Ilio two wins canela T shirt. I gotta tell you, I have an idea for it. Campbell's soup. Two oh, wins. Oh there you go, yeah. There <laughs> you go. What do you think about that, Elio? Well soup is good food. <laughs> <laughs> gotta be good to play. You've done so much for us, Elio. We couldn't, we couldn't get, to, we couldn't have got this far without you, pal. You're oh, definitely part of the team, and we're glad to have you. That's I see. That's I see. You see quite the top twenty list you have there. I'm oh, sorry. Mm-hmm. 
That was quite the list you have there, the top 20. Yes. What do you oh, think, man? I see the George Steele interview. Usually when you guys interview someone, you start off by asking them where they, where, how they got into the business. And then, That's then, something that always intrigues me. I, I've always found interest because everybody got their start differently. Everybody got, got caught the bug differently, and that is always something that has always interested me. Because then, I know I got I got interested differently at a, at a different age, and Austin did too, Nate did too, you did too, you know. And then someone like George Steele comes along and says like, it goes from not being a fan at all to like becoming one of the more popular guys in from the eighties. Absolutely. I find that interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. George was a lot of fun. George, you know, he he has his point of views on on life and and and, and liberty and and faith and from going to being one of the most hated to being one of the most beloved superstars. You know, he's come a long way. He's inspired many. And it just goes to show you, you know what, you can be an animal and still be one of the greatest of all time. And I've seen that the, the number one spot. That was pretty cool, that interview with uh, Jimmy Valiant. Woo, Mercy Daddy, that was yeah, a great was, one. I'm going to keep saying that because, you know, that was Jimmy Valiant. I see, I see that I finally hear the, the entire interview because so I only caught clips of it. So I finally got to sit down and listen to the entire interview. Yes, and for those who haven't heard it, we have a special. We had a special guest call in, a very good dear friend of of, of Jimmy's that called in and had a chat with him, live on air. You don't want to miss that chat. It was a lot of fun and very nice. Austin and I were like two kids in a candy store that day, listening to these two great legends chat. And if you don't know, now you know. You better go over there and listen. Yep. And I still have to update the YouTube channel, but. Uh Actually, even without updating, it's a, we we already have 150 subscribers. 150, nice. Yeah. Here's the cheers to 2015 to making it 300 my next year. You Maybe know. more. Yes, indeed. You know, we've got definitely how many we've got how many views have we gotten on our on our videos? Uh, close to like what 30,000, right? Oh, like uh, I have to I have to go back and look, but yeah, somewhere. That was the last there. time I checked. Yeah. I know it was over twenty. I know for a fact it was over twenty. Yeah, over. 20, I don't remember yeah. exactly the amount, but. Yeah, I mean, we've had a, but, a lot of great guests, on, but I believe, I mean, thirty thousand to whatever, they all want to listen to you know, listening to my voice. I wouldn't blame them either, you know. <laughs> just uh, twenty fifteen, Brad the Hitman Heart taking it off. Nigel McGinnis, um, LAFights dot com. Check it out. His project is one of a kind, is an understatement, and um, uh, you know just a lot of cool things to look forward to in 2015. And on you just Pipe heard it there, folks. Yeah, Our first two guests that. of 2015 will be coming on. They just Austin just announced the next one coming on the very next night. I love hey, the Felix. As well. You mind if you mind if I put uh, Brother Elio on the spot for a second? Uh oh. Go for it, man. Go for it. I know he'll love it. Because <laughs> uh, what's going on, Elio? Not too much. How are you, Nate? I'm doing good, man. First of all, appreciate all the hard work you do uh, week in and week out, man. And okay. but next next year, 2015, <laughs> you know, I, I've been talking about Pipe Bomb Radio on my other podcast, The Kings of Sport. And what I hear from people that listen to The Kings of Sport is we love the guests that you got on Pipe Bomb, but we need an easier way to get to you. We need you on iTunes. We need you on Stitcher. So I'm saying, let me talk to Elio. Let me talk to Felix. That's something we got to bring to the people next year. About well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. iTunes and Stitcher. We we can do it. Three of us. And, well, yeah, we'll leave Austin actually, to the side. Leave. <laughs> believe it or not, we're actually on iTunes. We are. We yes, are on we iTunes, are. but you know we oh, don't mention we it. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, yes, we Pipe Bomb Radio is on iTunes. I set that yeah. up uh, about a couple yeah. of years ago. The show is all right. automatically right. done with my iPod. There you go. <laughs> and the next. Next, the next step, the other half of that, we got to get on Stitcher, and then we'll have a we'll have the whole market corner. There you well, go. You know, next thing you know, we'll be I looking to maybe doing a is, something like uh like a, like Evan Ginsberg does out of New York, and have our own. Who knows? Hey, never say never. Maybe we can have our own television uh, show where we have our own guests come on the show there. Hey, it's well, okay know, to dream. Right? Know, actually, it's popular. Like one thing we've learned this year, whether it was Cole Cabana or whether it was Steve Austin or Jim Ross, like. Wrestling podcasts is, is are starting to get into the mainstream. Mm. Yes, and we are. were doing it before it was cool. We really were. I, uh, I think the horizon 
the, I think in the in the sky in the horizon it says podcast one is the, the main event. You know what we're looking forward to to get into hopefully one of these days, and that's um that's my goal. You know I think it's Nate's and Felix as well. You know Pipe Bomb Radio came here to chew bubble gum and kick ass, and we's all out of bubble gum, folks. There you go. <laughs> Thought you guys might like that one. <laughs> Since uh, Austin decided to ra- use one of Piper's phrases, I'll use another one. But, well, uh, have some juicy fruit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, go handle your tutti fruity gum. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but um, we, like I said, Elio. I mean, I like the idea of the shirt. I, I, you know, we do. We've come a long way, and with your help, we've helped. Uh, we've definitely been able to expand. Uh, get more people listening and talking, and, and you do a great job, man. I know in the circumstances, sometimes it come up, and, and, and you still knock it out of the park for us, and we can't thank you enough for it. You're and, welcome. And uh, we wish you the best for 2015. Long road ahead of us, man, but you know what? This team is strong. We're ready to kick some butt, and I think we'll do it, and the surprises are going to keep on coming, let me just tell you. Why can't we go? I was uh, thinking. I was saying the other day. Um, I think we were like the four horsemen of the podcasting world. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and I'm Ric Flair. Okay, I'm Ric Flair. Let's get it, you know, straight and uh, and everything. You know, uh, I guess uh, Nate's gonna be Arn, and uh, you know, uh, you're gonna be Telly Phillips, and Nate is gonna be uh, no, I prefer JJ to be JJ Dillon. Dillon. Thank Ole. you much. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll say Austin probably Oli because he's the cantankerous. Really, one. huh? <laughs> really. <laughs> Well, <laughs> interesting choice, to say the least, no doubt. But um, it's been a hell of a year, guys. 2015, while I've got the four, well, the three of us, the four of us on here, I'm going to go through it to each one of you. And if you've got a New Year's resolution, oh, you know what, who could we, we our, our company would not be complete Unless we included just another person who has definitely been a great help to us, a great part of the team over the last year. Austin knows this guy all too well, and I believe, Nate, this might ring a bell for you, pal. Welcome back to the show. Matt, how you doing, man? Hey, Hey. Felix. Hey, Dave. Hey, Austin. Just want to give you guys a happy New Year's coming up, because I know New Year's is right around the corner. You know, actually, while we're on Matt Nelson on the line right now, Boom. Actually, well, you know what? Let me go open. ahead and just go and do this real quick while I have all of you guys on the line. Mm. You've all helped us out in, in quite different ways, some more than others. I'm going to go first off to you, Nate, and then go down the line. As 2015 approaches, do you have a New Year's resolution? If so, would you mind sharing that with us or what you expect to see in 2015 <laughs> from Pipe Bomb Radio? Well, uh, first of all, personally, my uh, personal New Year's resolution is to uh, quit smoking, uh, get, get in better health, uh, you know, because I, w- I want to be around to see uh, see what's going on, not only in the wrestling world, but, you know, with my family. I've got three nieces, so I want to get a little bit healthier uh, and stick around for them. But in terms of Pipe Bomb Radio, I just want the show to get bigger and better. Like I said, you know, I think there's an audience that is definitely li- wanting to hear stuff like this, wanting to hear some of the legends talk wanting to hear some people that don't really get the spotlight, you know, your mainstream WWE folks. And, you know, where else are you going to hear a conversation like we had with Kevin Von Erich, like we had with Jimmy Valiant, like we had with Raymond Rowe. And so, uh, you know, I want to keep this thing going. I think we got a good team, you know, you, myself, and even Austin. And, and again, you know, shout out to Matt and to Elio. And I think, uh, you know, this is going to be a really good year and, and just keep getting bigger and better and, and bringing people what they want to hear. There you go, pal. Couldn't have said it better myself. Um, I'm going to turn over, turn the mic over to Elio. Uh, you've been with us since uh, t- I think since earlier this year, probably late last year. I don't remember exactly when you joined us, but um, I want to ask you if you've got a New Year's resolution ahead for 2015. If you care to share it, um, whether pertaining to you personally or for what you would like to see for Pipe Bomb Radio. So Fire away, pal. I see for myself. Uh, well, health wise, to like feel a lot better than I have, like, uh, towards the end of this year. So hopefully 2015 is a better year. And for Pipe Mom, well, 
I'm going to see what they say in the, in the WWE and expect and expect it. <laughs> Very well put. Very well put. Mr. Matt Nelson, the one and only. He is the TNA icon, the Twitter icon. He call, any kind of icon you call him, he's probably one of those. But um, <laughs> you've heard the shows. You've followed us since the beginning. As we approach 2015, any New Year's resolutions you care to share with us personally or what you'd like to see happen for for Pipe Bomb Radio? Well, uh, you may know, I got a sweet, beautiful baby niece that was just born a couple of months ago, Shady oh, Ann Nelson. And uh, I hope she will be growing up to be a beautiful angel. And what's to come for 2015 for Pipe Bomb Radio? Looking forward, looking forward for all the surprises coming up on Pipe Bomb Radio in 2015. You guys are phenomenal at what y'all do. And I really support you guys a lot. You guys are great. We appreciate that. Definitely very much. And, um, of course, I got to turn the mic over to old Jimmy Neutron. I mean, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I mean, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> He's been my partner funny, huh? through this whole mess. He's been my partner. He's been, we've butted heads, we've argued, we've yelled, we've laughed, we've talked, we've done, we've been through it all and then some. Hell, he's my pipe bomb radio wife, if you will. That being said, and that's not meant as an insult. It's not meant as an insult. It's more the fact that you've been with me to see through a lot of this craziness that we've done on this show and a lot of the fun times. So, pal, wow, I want to ask huh? you. Funny, make some making jokes, right? You know, talking about um, uh, the Austin James. You know, my uh, I was getting uh, my... to that, but go ahead and say what you got to say since you, you know, insist I on will. cutting I'll me off. The, the rain. The rains and everything in, uh, that are on this train have been going on for quite some time. And uh, I'll tell you, my New Year's resolution is to be, you know, better than I already am, you know, to be honest with you. And it's, um, uh, that's, that's always the goal, right? And every single week I prove it. Um, and, uh, you know, actually mentioning another note about Matt Nelson, this is actually pretty interesting. Um, if TNA Wrestling, if you go on TNA's Twitter account right now, TNA, the only people they follow is their roster, you know, except one guy, Matt Nelson, is the, he's a TNA representative, the, the only guy not affiliated with the roster that TNA follows you know, in Impact Wrestling. I thought it was pretty pretty well, interesting. I have no clue how it happened, but, you know, being that he, he tweets almost every single second of the day about TNA Wrestling, Destination America, who I believe, I think every single person in the world has on their, their television system, um, uh, Matt Nelson, uh, you know, being followed by TNA Russell is pretty cool. Well, there you go, folks. He didn't. He was too. He was so nice. He didn't even want to give his own thoughts on the future of Pipe Bomb Radio, unless he did. Oh, which okay. Probably Mentioning the future of Pipe Bomb Radio. Um, uh, always the goal. Better than I am today, I will be tomorrow. Absolutely, you already know it. You know, you really do. Yeah. Oh, speaking of um, uh, the future, the future. What I'm looking in my my eyes here and um. My vision with my vision is, is Oscar. Oscar from Mineral Mission Thursday night show, Not Trauma do Radio it, Show. I beat him once. I'll beat him again. Do it, do Rap it. battle number two. Don't do it. Do it. <laughs> yes, that battle rap was something I never, ever thought I would see, live to hear, or even be part of. Austin has got more guts than brains sometimes. In this case, he had a lot more guts. Most cases he's got a lot of brains, but in this case he had a lot of guts to go up and uh, yourself, go up against man. somebody who's who's rapped for the last twenty years and can rap on the fly. I mean, he just if you go onto his Facebook uh, his his Facebook page that he's got the, the 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 fan page, I posted up a video of him singing the song to to um, Zach Gowan's fiance. It wrapped a quick little little number for his fiance and pretty pretty nifty, pretty nifty. Feel like but really as far as I'm concerned, Matt, I gotta tell can I speak now? Can, 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 I, can I speak now? Or do you have something no. else you want to add to it? Well, no, I was Please, if you have something to say, go ahead. Me. I was going to say, well, what, Eminem, J- Jay-Z, Lil Wayne, they all you know can't touch me when it comes to rapping. Oscar, wow. he's awesome what he does. Not far as radio mm. show Thursday nights at 8 p.m. I'm not sure if they have a show. But um, they they will, I believe, be back in uh, 2015. They will be back January 8th. We haven't decided on who the guest is just yet, but stay tuned for local listings and postings on Facebook. Um, as far as I, this year's gone, 
Uh, I've got you all on here now, and you all are listening as well. It's been an incredible year. It, I, when I decided to bring it back, I never really, really, really would have thought we would have gone a year, let alone approaching going into our third year now. You know, we we've had some of the best, some of the best of the best, but we have not gotten the rest, and we got to get the rest in order to say we are the best. And with that, I, I want to thank you guys all for putting in your part to help spread the word of Pi Bomb Radio. Some obviously help in different ways, and I appreciate you all. As far as 2015 goes, I have some transformations, some changes I have in store for myself health-wise. And, and um, as far as Pipe Bomb goes, honestly, my ultimate goal would be to have my own uh, studio to do the show from. And I'm very proud of the success that uh, Men on a Mission have, have been having as of late. They, when they were doing their shows, they were doing them back to back and kicking some butt. Very proud of that partnership. We've come a long way as well. We butted heads with them as well, as far as keeping up to who's doing the best and who's out doing the other. Because there will come days that they'll do better than we do on shows, and that's a rare thing because we kick butt. We do. But all things considered, we're all a team, and I'm proud of each and every one of you. And I thank you for all you guys have continued to do for me, for the show, for the betterment of the show. Which is what more, which what counts most. So with that, folks, I wish you guys, wish you all, a very safe and happy 2015. Let's knock down that door and make 2015 our bitch. Excuse my language, Austin. I know he's going to kill me for saying that, but you know what? I just said it. We'll make that. We'll make 2015 our female beach. dog. There you go. How do you like that? Perfect. That's fantastic. <laughs> But, um, Helio, Matt, we appreciate you guys. We can't thank you enough for what you guys do for us. Uh, thank you guys for calling in tonight. You're welcome. You're welcome. And we will chat with you guys in 2015. All right. Take care, guys. All right. Happy New Year, guys. Uh, happy, happy New, New Year. Year. Happy New Year, guys. Happy New Year, Matt. Take it easy, Matt. And as far as our team goes, as far as tonight, shut up. (laughs) As far as tonight goes, (laughs) it's been an incredible run, guys. Let's make it. Let's make 2015 an even better year. Thank you guys for what you do. And uh, well, the best is coming Tuesday night. The best there is, was, and ever will be. Let's make it. Let's make that a one hell of an interview, guys. Happy New Year to you guys, and I wish you guys the best. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it, man. It's it's been a fun first year with me with the team, but, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to next year, man, and I can't think of a better way to kick things off than with Brett the Hitman Hart. So uh, thank you to everybody out there listening. Happy New Year, and uh, just be safe. If I can say one thing, don't be an idiot over the New Year's uh, weekend, like the New Year's Eve. Just don't be an idiot. If you're going to drink, don't drive. Be safe. Act like you got some sense. <laughs> and any any last words uh, before I go ahead and cut it off, Austin? Yes. Was I shocked? Not really. <laughs> go ahead, pal. What you got to say? That was my last final word. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> On behalf of Austin, Nate, myself, Felix, your host for Pipe Bomb Radio, 2014 last show of the year signing off we'll see you guys in 2015 make sure you guys keep reaching keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars good night everybody happy new year